terrorism. Can we start? Let me start. Thank you. All right. You know, a lot of times people that I talk to, they're, they kind of turn their nose up and they, their brain kind of shuts down at this section. I think, what's this got to do with me? But every single act of terrorism starts in a house or in a small town or a big town. It starts with a small per one person or a small group, doesn't it? <clears throat> Just like there's nothing to say a tornado won't hit Buffalo next week, there's nothing to say that there could not be a terrorist act because the terrorist, the definition of terrorism we'll talk about, but uh, anywhere there's a group of people someone could decide this is a way for me to try to further my political agenda or just enact some type of revenge for some real or perceived slight. Oh, like the, the, uh, a couple of years back, there was a bombing on a jogging thing. I remember, right? yeah. Talking about the ball in Boston? Uh, yes, I believe so. Yeah? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, crap out of me. My sister's a jogger. So... <laughs> You know, just re just think about the fact that just because we're from a small community now doesn't mean that it can't happen here. You know, I'll tell you, there's uh, in the in Missouri we have Posse Comitatus, which is a terrorist, uh, a vigilante group that doesn't believe in uh, paying taxes and doesn't believe in uh, government's right to do stuff. You know, you had the Branch Davidians in Waco. We've got people that have some of those same feelings right here in the Ozarks. Now, there's no sign when you drive by identifying where they are. That's not what they do, but uh, it could happen here. So just keep an open mind about it. So we're going to talk about terrorism. We're going to talk de define what it is, and that's, you know, okay, that's what the government says it is. We'll talk about what are some targets in the community that might be a, something that the terrorists might be interested in looking at. We'll talk about the eight signs of terrorism. We'll talk about uh, our operating procedures if there's an air, a ter excuse me, a terrorist event. And uh, we'll talk about what to do immediately following something that happens if we think it's a potentially a terrorist activity. The topics that will support that, what is terrorism, terrorist targets, terrorist weapons, seaborne, chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosive. See what seaborne, that's the acronym. Government loves an acronym, so that's what the, the basically the five groups, indicators of those. Preparing at home, work, and in your neighborhood, and certs and terrorist incidents. So, okay, definition. Yeah, you'll be expected to recite this, just boom, right up. No, I'm kidding, you won't. You won't. But the government says it's the unlawful use of force or violence against persons or property to intimidate or coerce a government, the civilian population, or any segment thereof in furtherance of political or social objectives. So, burning a black church. They're trying to intimidate a portion of the community. Uh... Messing with a uh, Islamic mosque, same thing, right? I uh, believe I remember right. Same thing as for the whole uh, cross burning, doing burning crosses on the yard facilities. There's terrorism. Sure, sure. Uh, all of those things. So that's the definition, and yet there's a lot of things that would fit in that definition. So in the past, what have we had? Well, this is. Uh, of course, an iconic photo. We know that's the World Trade Center in New York City in 9-11-01. Uh, uh, yeah. This is the Edward R. Murrow Building in Oklahoma City. That was done with... If you think about this, for the cost of a few airline tickets, a few thousand dollars, they cost the United States... I don't know what the value of those two towers and all the buildings around them, because most of those buildings got destroyed too. Billions and billions of dollars. 
That's a pretty good return on your investment, isn't it? Not to mention the cost of human lives. The cost in human lives and the cost that's been spent since that time. It's money sent to Missouri, money sent to Iowa, money sent to every state in the United States for equipment and training to combat this potential. There have been trillions of dollars spent since that time because they spent a few thousand dollars on airline tickets. Uh, I mean, you got to hand it to them. It's brilliant. Brilliant. I went to the training uh, shortly in 2005 for Highway Watch. Okay. I don't know what that is, but... It was basically a program for uh, truck drivers such as myself. Oh. To watch for terrorism on the highways. Mm. Okay. And I wish I had I, somewhere I still have the card and number for it too. That'd be interesting. Okay. Then the Edgar Murrow building, that was uh, a guy that was pissed off about Waco, the Branch Davidians. He was mad about the way the government treated the Branch Davidians. So what does he do? He buys a rider truck full of ammonium nitrate and fuel oil. He gets fuel oil, uh, some catalyst. You know, the ammonium nitrate, all you really have to do is have a strong initiating source. Remember we talked about the ship that blew up in the harbor from putting cold water on the, the hot ship, right? Just a strong shock will initiate that blast. That's what took out the... This was Edward R. Murrow building. It was a government building with a bunch of government workers. It also had daycare and a bunch of other stuff in there, some bunch of civilians in there. So. It didn't really separate those, you just wiped the whole thing out. So uh, these are, are classic examples of things in the past. What are the goals? Well, mass casualties. You know, nobody's going to get real excited about if you wipe out one person. You know, they want a lot of people, a big splash. Uh, critical resources. Uh, most people don't know about it, but the World Trade Center had a huge uh, communication footprint on top, antenna towers, they were, they were so tall. So a lot of communications for a large section of the country actually went through that, you know, your big broadcast studios and stuff were from there. So it affected our communication ability to some degree. Disruption of vital services, disruption of the economy, heightened fear. Think about what happened after 9-11. If you were somewhere trying to fly home, you didn't. All flights in the United States were grounded except government flights. All flights. I mean, anywhere in the United in Washington State, your flights were grounded. It didn't matter where you're from. They just weren't going to take that chance. So, huge disruption to the economy. There's no telling how much that cost in dollars. Just that. Canada, been huge. Ground all their yeah, yeah, it was gigantic disruption. So, uh, and disruption of vital services. Think about what would happen if they went to our one of our uh, key points in our uh, electrical grid, which are antiquated and not well protected. Anybody, you know, any one of us could go to one of those and take one of them out if we wanted to. Wouldn't take a rocket scientist to do that. They're not very well protected, are they? Take that out. Think about what would happen to how many people would be affected by that. And what kind of disruptions? So, and you know, you don't see the senators are talking about this and that, but nobody's talking about well, we need to reinvest and upgrade and protect our infrastructure. What would the United States have if we don't have electricity? Be like TV show on TV that aired in the past. I don't know if y'all watched it, but there was a, a, a whole long series on two or three years of it and what happened after all the electronics shut down. And uh, that's what it would be like. I think I know what you're talking about, though. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff and, and fear. The biggest thing they want is everybody to be afraid. And that's pretty easy to have happen, right? Today's world, you know, you put one thing on Facebook, true or not true, put one thing on Facebook, and it's everywhere, all over the world, almost instantly, isn't it? 
because he could have written yeah. about anything on the internet. True. So, uh, other things. Seats of government. Key industries, bridges, subways, tunnels, other key facilities, water supplies and utilities. We talked about the utilities already. What about water supplies? Uh, water treatment plants. That. What about in California? You know, most of the water from California comes over that viaduct from the mountains. There's miles and miles and miles of that. A couple of sticks of dynamite in the right place, blow that up. What happens to all the water supply for most of that part of California? So, there's just a lot of ways a person could do something. Possibly target a dam. What kind of, yeah, yeah. So, uh, we talked about seaborne chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, high yield explosives. These are the, the acronyms for the different ways that they can use. Notice nowhere on here does it say anything about airplanes. Not airplane contains high yield explosive, it contains jet fuel, which is pretty explosive when it runs into a building, but you know, but there's there's a lot of ways to do something. So we're gonna go through and talk. Okay, chemical weapons. There's we break those big category down into smaller categories. We've got blistering agents, blood agents, choking agents, nerve agents, and riot control agents. You guys Having had a military background, we'll be very familiar with probably several or most of these. So, so okay, biological weapons. You, to, to have a biological weapon, there has to be some way to get it into us. So the routes of exposure for us are either inhalation, ingestion, or absorption. So you can absorb it through my skin. The skin is the largest organ in your body, you know, and very coarse. So the skin, if, if we get something on our skin, we can easily absorb it into our body. We can inhale it and we can ingest it into our nose or our mouth. Those are the routes for biological weapons. Let me get caught up in my book here. And, uh, in the Army, they didn't really teach us how to uh, recognize it. Well, they gave us a few signs, but Mostly the go-to thing to do would be grab everybody's med kit, grab two syringes, two injections, and one's for chemical and one's for biological, you have a better chance of surviving what's chemical and biological. One of the points it makes in the book is that many, but not all, of the biological agents can take days or even weeks for symptoms to appear, uh, biological agents. So you may not know that you've been affected when it happens, you probably won't know. And then it, when you do, you're not gonna know, oh, it was at that moment when that occurred, that, that'll have to be probably researched to try to figure out when the exposure happened. Because, you know, we, you go a lot of places in days, you know, was it McDonald's, was it Walmart, was it wherever I was, so. Um, Make sure they bring in CBC. Yeah, yeah, those, they've got people can track that down. Radiological weapons are considered a high threat because the uh, components are easy to obtain. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, the stuff to make a bomb. No, uh, plutonium is not easy to come up with. But there's radiological things all around us. There's radiological components and uh, smoke detectors. Well, uh, that's not one. That's, I don't see. The little battery card smoke detectors, they've got little small radioactive things in them. So, uh, and they're around us, around us quite a lot. So, because of that, they're considered a higher threat uh, because they're fairly easy to obtain. Uh, so we've got radiological dispersive devices, which are improvised explosive devices. If somebody rigged up a bomb and had a bunch of radiological, those little deals, some smoke detectors in them, then that would be called a dirty bomb. You know, easy enough to make. The bomb itself is, of course, a hazard, but then what it'll do, it'll expose a bunch of people to those radiological 
exposure. And it'll usually leave enough particulates and dust cloud to uh, their wind will carry it to a further distance. Well, not only that, not only to a further distance, but also just the people that don't get hurt by the explosion, they're going to breathe that in. So, you know, uh, you can get that stuff in hospitals, medical facilities, uh, a lot of there in a lot of places in commercial devices. So, you know, they're around. Uh, nuclear weapons, we, we know what nuclear weapons will do. But we don't really need to elaborate on that. It can affect large areas. We always see the TV shows and the movies on TV where the, somebody's gotten a hold of a bomb and they're going to blow up some big city. The likelihood that somebody's going to blow up little old Buffalo are not very big, I'll, I'll be honest. Why? Because if they go to the expense and the trouble to get a nuclear device, you're not going to get much bang for your buck in Buffalo. Too hard to obtain. They're going to want to get the best yield that they can. Maybe Springfield, you know, that's 250-some thousand people. There, there could be a big enough crowd there. Or St. Louis or Branson. St. Louis, sure. you take out to the all the national landmarks. and Sure. St. Louis would be a much more likely target. The big cities, you know, and frankly, the big cities are more hardened, more trained, more prepared for that type of event than the smaller towns are. So there's not... I don't think a huge concern for us for nuclear weapons here. I'd be more concerned about, you know, uh, an Air Force uh, piece of equipment <laughs> crashing in Dallas County that had a nuclear device on board as opposed to some terrorist trying to do something. That would, to me, be a more likely scenario. But we just need to be aware of it. Uh, Whitman Air Force Base is not that far away. Fort Leonard Wood is not that far away, and if it ever came to shooting, Whitman Air Force Base, base would, would be a likely target because, you know, that's where the our bombers go, and they go all over the world from right there. So uh, they start there, and then they fly to wherever they need to go, and then they fly home, refuel as they go. So are we far enough away from Whitman? Uh, depends on which way the wind blows. Right? Mm -hmm. Far enough away from the blast, we far enough away from the radiation, yeah, we're relatively close. So, um, affected areas, flash. <laughs> affected areas uh, larger as, as contaminated objects spread. So, yeah, when the, we talked about once about hazmat scene and we try to keep people in the scene and not get ourselves in the scene so that we don't make become part of the problem and so we don't make the scene bigger. If those people are moving around, the scene's getting larger as they move, right? It's the same way with this. <coughs> Casualties may extend far beyond where the initial point and the long-term effects will be difficult. We know that when we bombed Japan, uh, we got there's a great deal of information available on long-term effects there, and it was horrific, right, so. Yeah, I just think re more recent was Chernobyl. Yeah, that wasn't, that wasn't an explosion per se, but it certainly was an exposure, and, and uh, they did about everything wrong that you could do. Oh, yeah. You know, so, <laughs> so, because that's their, kind of their way of doing things, so, yeah, you know, so. Uh, high yield explosives, that's our, the most popular thing for terrorists because you want something that goes boom, you know, you, you got to get your thrills. But uh, it's pretty easy to get multiple ways. Most terrorist attacks are using high yield explosives. You can use military musicians, there's like grenades, mortars, surface air missiles. Uh, Newer explosives called IEDs, we know all about that from the news, and uh, there were any of any you in Iraq, Afghanistan? My brother was, but yeah. he's told me about a lot of that. I have no personal experience, but I know that that's something they face daily. Yes. Yeah, so, I was prepping for going over there, to, they said that with IEDs, you only limit your imagination. Yeah, bodies buried, you name it, cars full of explosives. Just whatever you can think of. Well, the most terrifying thing is it could be as simple as a coffee can sitting on the side. 
the, bot, the bottom cave in, turns it into a, yeah. basically a, a armor piercing missile that they used to use in World War II to destroy tanks. Sure, sure. So it can be about anything. Uh, any device created in an improvised manner used to destroy, disfigure, distract, or harass. So that could be anything. And we've already talked about uh, anhydrous ammonia and, and ammonium nitrate, right? We've got thousands of pounds of ammonium nitrate right up here in MFA and fertilizer plant. I said anhydrous ammonia. I forget. I, I keep throwing that in. That's not it. Anhydrous ammonia is dangerous when you lose control of it, but it's not considered being a, it's not an explosive. It's ammonium nitrate and then then some initiating device, right? So let me correct myself. I just remember Bass Pro also uses ammonium nitrate explosive targets. Oh, they're ta uh, ta uh, tannerite. tannerite. Yeah, whatever that stuff is. Yeah, that's that stuff's legal to sell. Probably Walmart sells it. So, okay, there you go. So, how do I assess the risk? When I show up on a scene, what, how do I assess to determine that? Because I don't want to walk onto a scene that's a radiological fallout, nuclear fallout, any of that stuff. Okay. So, the, the, the greatest risk, to the, or the least risk to the greatest risk, how do I assess it? Well, nuclear is least. Why? Not because it's not dangerous. It's the least likely for them to be able to get a hold of that. You know, even whole countries can't get a hold of a nuclear device. So an individual would even be harder, right? So uh, chemical. Uh, chemicals themselves are easy to get, but these biological type or uh, the chemicals that they want to use to do a terrorist event are what makes them difficult is being able to disperse them in a way that will be effective over a long period of time. Getting the chemical itself is not necessarily all that hard, but being able to have a dispersal method that's effective because you need to make it little small droplets you need to be able to disperse it over a wide period a wide area and that's something the military's got the capability of doing but most other people do not okay so, so uh, the movie the rock for <coughs> so that's again not as big a risk radiological those are easy to come up with we talked about that and anybody can make some kind of an explosive device to make a dirty bomb so that's a little greater risk Greater risk than that is biological. There have been several attacks, sarin, sarin attacks. People sending letters through the mail with white powder. Anthrax. You know, anthrax and other items. So those people, that's, that's a terrorist attack. And it's not explosive, but nonetheless, it is something. So, and then high yield explosives, which is used in 80% of the cases, is course your greatest sign so this is the one you want to be most concerned about and aware of this would be the one that least so what are the signs what do I look for uh, somebody doing surveillance in a place where you shouldn't see that uh, if you have someone asking a lot of questions about the courthouse how many people are normally here? And you've never seen this person. They're not from here. They don't identify themselves. Oh, why are you taking pictures of the courthouse? Now, that doesn't mean somebody can't take a picture of the courthouse. April may take pictures of the courthouse and put on a website because we're going to do a training class. That's fine. There's no law against that. But if they're taking it from all sides and, I, and taking pictures of people that come and go and mapping out escape routes and all the roads around it and all that stuff. That is not what normal people do. So you sh antennas should start quivering just a little bit, right? Okay. So one thing to think about. Elicitation. Uh, asking questions. Okay. They're gathering information specific to the target. Specific. Okay. How many people would work in a courthouse? Are there security cameras? 
or they're walking around looking for security cameras. Are there metal detectors? You know, how, when is court? You know, when is the maximum number of people there? Things like that. When they start asking those questions, okay, what, why? Uh, and that may be asking in person. It might be somebody on the phone. It might be somebody sends you a survey asking for that information. Tests of security. Somebody is going to walk somewhere and see if uh, anybody's watching the cameras. Or, I'll tell you in the past, I made the comment when I did this job 10, 12 years ago, there were no metal detectors at, the, at all in the courthouse. And I made, often made the comment, so the terrorists can come in there and sit down when, on court day with the judge and 80 people in there, set a briefcase down right there by the bench, say, could you, excuse me, would you watch my briefcase for a moment? Or say nothing, maybe. Leave it sitting right here. Walk around the corner, go into, like they're going to go to the restroom. Walk on out the entrance on the other side. Get in their car, back up, and go two blocks away. Dial a number on a phone or press a button on a radio. And blow the whole thing up. And nobody would ever pay any attention. Why? Because we're a little small rural community. And nobody felt like there's, it can't happen here. This is Buffalo. But it could, couldn't it? Mm -hmm. No reason it couldn't. Just takes one person with a twisted idea about something. So said so it's not likely. So it's not impossible. <laughs> anything is possible. So, uh, and that's one of the battles, honestly, as emergency management director that I fight, is to convince the powers that be that just because it has never happened doesn't mean it won't happen, and that it can't happen. You know, because there's a a little bit of a head in the sand attitude. Well, why should we spend money on that when we've never had that before? You know, so a little bit of a battle. Okay, uh, so people testing the security. Find out if, if what the level of security is, watching if, uh, if somebody does respond, how long does it take them to get there? So I know how much time I have to be able to get away. Now remember, terrorists don't always care about getting away, do they? Certain groups, you know, especially uh, Muslims, you know, if they die in an attack, well, they've got a bunch of virgins waiting for them in heaven. So, you know, a little murder thing. You know, yeah. So they're they're not necessarily planning on escaping. Uh, funding. People raising, transferring, or spending a bunch of money. Uh, they may do that by selling drugs. They may steal stuff. Uh, funding on money through businesses or charities to fund the operation they're doing now, that would be difficult for us to notice. But, I mean, you know, we would possibly know that, but. Acquiring supplies. Okay, what's needed to prepare the attack? That could be weapons, weapon components, transportation, communication. Uh, supplies may be purchased with cash only, so. Uh, think about the bombing at the uh, Boston Marathon. They used pressure cookers and they had a bunch of shrapnel in there, what ball bearings and different things they put popped in there. Well, you know, where do you buy ball bearings? Hardware store. Can you buy them at a hardware store? Sometimes. Uh, you know, but I mean, you could go to a machine shop, maybe yeah. a place that works with ball bearings and say, hey, I want to buy a bunch of you know, I use them, well, I don't know what story they told, but, you know, somebody comes up with a bunch of that stuff, that might be something that's... Yeah, what are they? Certain not of stuff shots, because I remember that one guy that I went to a couple of ball bearings for Mark's Cleveland. Okay, interpersonal or suspicious people. Um, people that impersonate someone with a particular role or a particular job to get access or to get information. Or the people that just don't, something don't happen, don't feel right. They don't fit in. They, it, you know, they don't seem to belong where they are. So somebody, just because somebody's got a uniform doesn't mean anything, does it? Because you can get in, you can get uniforms, you can get badges, you can print credentials. So a business card or a name badge or a whatever. 
that really doesn't prove a lot, does it? Could have been stolen. Some of the worst case scenarios, people uh, falsify uh, the police badges. Yeah, oh yeah, they everything gets, you know, Remember, FBI that. credentials, you name it. Department of Homeland Security, you know. So, uh, that's another thing that, that would be another sign. And then we have, uh, generally before they will do an attack, they'll do some kind of a rehearsal or a dry run to uh, see how long it takes to drive, to see if, if I park a van in front of here that's full of, loaded full of and, uh, 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 modium nitrate. Will anybody notice? Will anybody pay any attention? You know, put a box van in front of the city hall and park it there for two hours. Does anybody come out to find out what's in it? Why are you here? And what's going on? And then just how long does it take to get away? If, if I do something, how long does it take for the... Might call in a fake police report and see how long it takes the police to show up. Just give them an idea, you know. It's going to take them to show up, how they process it. and So, I've often maintained that in Buffalo that you can have a van full of Muslims and the whole Muslim get-up with a loudspeaker springing, singing praises to Allah and Muhammad, uh, uh, Muhammad's picture on the side of the van and drive it through town and around the square and not very many people would pay any attention to it whatsoever. They wouldn't even notice it. Just because we are so complacent about possibility that that could happen here. We're protected, right? We're protected because we're small. We remember the definition of terrorism. To intimidate, coerce, create fear. So at the football field on Friday night when the football field is playing well and the other home team is there and the other team is there and we've got three or four hundred people down there. Would killing three or four hundred people be a big enough, is that a big enough group to, because your chances of getting caught in Buffalo, pretty low, right? Wouldn't you agree? Pretty slim. This is not a hardened community. And we're not on the lookout. I mean, try it in New York City, you're probably going to get caught and arrested or killed. Because mm -hmm. That stuff happens to them all the time. <coughs> but here, it can happen. You catch them with their pants down. It, it can happen. I mean, it, not, I don't know a reason why it would happen, and I'll go to football games too. But it's just, we just are, we, we lead, we feel like we lead a protected life, and we, we should be more alert. Uh, and then, after they've done all this stuff, then deploy. Do the call. That's when the, that's when the attack is getting ready to take place. Okay, if you have even just a few of these signs, may indicate the possibility of a terrorist attack. If you see some of these signs, report it to your local law enforcement. What's it going to harm? If somebody's asking a bunch of questions about the courthouse, maybe they're writing a book. If they're on the, on the level, it won't hurt anything for law enforcement to ask them what's going on. I'll give you an example. South of town, you guys know where Hostetler's got the store out here that sells lawnmowers and yep. feed and everything out here. It's not right on 65, it's just off 65. Just before you get there, the Dallas County Propane, it's now Thompson Gas, it's got those huge propane tanks right there. I got a call one day. I, it was a S Super Bowl day. I had people coming over to my house to watch Super Bowl. We had we were eating supper before the game. And I got a phone call that someone had found a briefcase sitting on top of the concrete saddle supports for those big tanks. Under the tank. Right up inside there briefcase sitting there. Well, that's a weird place to keep a briefcase, right? Yeah. So they called me, and it was a Dallas County deputy, and I went out there, 
I didn't go right up to it. Met up on the highway, told me what it was, and I said, well, <clears throat> it could be anything. It could be drugs. It could be cash. It could be a bomb. I'm thinking terrorist attack. Somebody. And they want to blow it up. What a great way. You know, so I advised them to shut down that highway right there. You know, this was before the new highway was built. The 65 went right by the tanks. I said, I advised them to shut the highway down at, at F Highway and go back up to Gravel Road back up on the south side and route traffic around. And that would have left just... You know, the, the Hostetler's place was not, it wasn't open for business at that point. There was a couple of houses nearby. I said, we could just evacuate those for right now, shut this highway down, and reroute traffic until the Springfield Bomb Squad gets down here and checks this out, because we don't know what it is. And uh, so the deputy, we called the bomb squad, and they, they said they would come. It takes a while. So we're sitting there waiting, and I'm back up at the Mennonite place, you know, Hostetler's away, a little bit away. And the Highway Patrol shows up. And he doesn't talk to me. He goes right down to the deputy. Talks to him for a minute. And then he comes talks to me. And he says, we're not shutting 65 down. Said, well, if that would happen to be a bomb, he says, we're not shutting 65 down. Period. And he knew me. I knew him. I said, well, my recommendation, he says, I understand the potentials. We're not shutting 65 down. I said, okay, your call. I'm going to document, and my recommendation is better safe than sorry. He says, that's noted. And so I wrote out a good report, you know, and made sure if anybody gets killed, well, it's documented. I recommended that we do this. And then they had the bomb squad come down. And... Uh, turned out it, it wasn't a bomb, it wasn't drugs or cash, it was empty. Now, my, I suspect that was probably a drop-off point for drugs and cash, but we caught it at a point where there was nothing in it. That's all what I suspect. But anyway, that's a case of where I treated it like what it looked like. I looked at the clues. Now, what was the harm? Well, I missed out on a little bit of fellowship during the Super Bowl game. I still got to watch most of it. Uh, nobody got hurt. And I've got another case about, remember the exploding donut story? <laughs> yeah. I'll tell that one another time. That's, a, that's <laughs> one that happened to me in St. Louis, St. Charles, actually. But uh, I'll, in, in the interest of moving on with the class, I won't tell it right now. But when you see something that fits this definition. If you have your head in the sand and you say, ah, it can't be. Well, maybe you're right. Maybe you're wrong. What's the harm in using your training and at least checking out to see if it is something or not? What's the harm? The worst, you made yourself look silly, but you're still there. The sun's still shining, the birds are still singing. It's all good, right? So don't be shy about applying your training. I mean, don't be... There has to be something, something that makes you think this might be a terrorist attack. Just because there's a McDonald's bag laying on the side of the road doesn't mean it's an IED going down 65 Highway. Is there any other thing that may indicate that as well, that lead you down this trail. But if you see it, don't be afraid to call. Now I'll tell you during the, when they were doing the, the, uh, the biological weapons, you know, where the white powder scare was going on, uh, we had people calling in, uh, I drink a cup of coffee and in my saucer there was white powder. Well, you, well, yeah, dumbass, you missed the cup when you put the sugar in, you know. Uh, people were almost literally that dumb, you know, a lot of ridiculous calls. They put a lot of work on the responders, but they dealt with it. We dealt with it. We had a, we had a few here in Dallas County, people calling in for white powder. 
No, of course, no legitimate calls. So don't be afraid to to connect the dots if you have evidence. Okay. Now, what makes you think that maybe an attack has occurred or is underway? Uh, vapor clouds are mist. I'm not talking about you know in the spring or the fall. We're going to get fog. There may be vapor clouds. You get a hot day and moisture. There can be vapor. Yeah. But is it green? Is, is it a weird color? Is it a hot day with no reason at all for there to be vapor in the place you're seeing it? And now all of a sudden there is a vapor? That might be something. Uh, people, airplanes flying over, spraying uh, in a place where they shouldn't be. In an agricultural area, we don't see a lot of spraying in Dallas County, do we? I won't say never, because there have been some, but there's not a great deal of that, because basically, you know, most of Dallas County is dairy cattle, beef cattle. We don't have a lot of agricultural, as far as grow commodity crops. And the crops we do grow are mostly hay, not a lot of grain, not a lot of that stuff. So we don't see a lot of people flying over. So if I saw somebody flying over Buffalo, spraying, you think that would, I would think that's weird? Absolutely. Why are you spraying? What? I would not be out there. I would be taking shelter. They didn't need that kind of special care. <laughs> right. So. Uh, materials or equipment that's unusual for the area. Yeah, what, what types of things are we talking about? Uh, lab equipment. Quantity of hazardous materials not typically located in that area. Dispersal devices. Uh, things like that. Okay. Unusual odors or tastes. Now, I want to make this point. If you smell something that has an unusual odor, you've already inhaled it, haven't you? So you, if it's a chemical agent, you're already affected, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're already there. So there's not a way for you to notice an unusual odor or an unusual taste without being involved with whatever that product is yourself, period. Out of place or unattended packages. I mentioned to you a briefcase up here by the courthouse. What about something like this? A package that's leaking. Okay, if anybody sent you something that's wrapped in paper, taped up real good, and it's wet, what would you think? And it's not been set down in a puddle by UPS. I'm not curious as to what the, it is. Yeah. Who sent me something and why? I mean, it got broke. Damn, UPS broke this. Whatever it is, what what would it be? What's leaking? So I'm going to rip into it and find out, right? Did you order something, uh, a big container of laundry soap, and they broke it because they kicked, dropped it across the, the, the warehouse? Or... Do, is this unexpected package? You need to think about that. <coughs> you may want to leave them right where they are. Uh, that's how they released the sarin gas in the Tokyo subway back in the back in the day. They uh, poked holes in bags containing sarin, then left it in the area and let the poison just leak out. Simple as that. If you think of any, if you see any of these things, don't touch it. Move yourself away from the object or area, and, and if other people are, move them away too if you can. At least tell them, and get a hold of authorities and report it immediately. Okay. One thing to remember when it comes to this right here that uh, we talked about this before, your cell phone and radios 
unless they're intrinsically safe devices, and they'll say they are. If they're not intrinsically safe, then using those inside an area that may have explosive vapors or something could cause an explosion. Okay, so if I've got a house full of propane and you want to talk to command, don't talk on your radio. Don't use your cell phone. Don't turn the light on and off because flipping a switch creates a small little spark. Okay? You don't do any of those things. Leave it like it is. Okay? Even a telephone, you know, a wall, there are still some people that have landline phones. Again, they have the juice in the line itself. So you don't want to use any of those things, anything that would create a spark. Nothing. You still do? Yeah, not not a lot. Uh, the percentage is getting lower and lower all the time. So it's the second number out of front. Specifically, we put a landline from there. Right. Okay. All right. So, what are some physical signs of a chemical or biological attack? Uh, sick or dead animals, fish, or birds. Now, this would be a sign, right? A bunch of cattle. Sometimes you can be fooled to see a cow or a horse on a, on a hot day like this. They may be laying on their side. You think, oh, they look dead. They're probably not dead. Now, if their legs are like this, they're probably dead. You know? But uh, large numbers of persons seeking medical attention, you would notice that. But people in the, the doctor's office, the walk-in clinics, they would notice that. Uh, multiple survivors exhibiting similar symptoms. Think about the people that came out of the, like uh, when some of the, they had some of those uh, fires in the subways and everybody came out hacking and coughing. <coughs> Think about the people in 9-11 that came out of the tower, that they got out of the towers before they collapsed and all of them were hacking and coughing that, that smoke and all that stuff. Uh, they all had similar symptoms, right? Multiple casualties without any obvious signs of trauma. Okay, that would be a pretty big sign, right? I got a bunch of people laying there not moving, and I don't see any blood anywhere. Okay, one person can just fall over. I could fall right over here and have a heart attack. But if 15 people all fell over, that'd be really weird, wouldn't it? Something's going on. So what can I do to prepare? Okay, we've talked about this before. Your safety and your family's safety is first. You can't effectively be ready to respond to help other people until you know that your family and your friends, your own personal world is taken care of. So that's number one. We are not equipped or trained to respond to terrorist incidents, are we? We don't have any special equipment. You're trained to maybe recognize that it might possibly be a terrorist event, but beyond that, no. So, terrorist incidents are crime scenes. So, everything that does happen at that scene needs to be documented. We don't want to move crap around. We want to leave it where it is. So, it's a law enforcement scene, so we're going to not move stuff around. These types of events are survivable. Uh, I might maintain that when it comes to the nuclear side, if somebody blows a nuclear bomb up on the square in Buffalo, eh, if I'm in my office, I'm, I'm not going to make it. <laughs> um, and I, I'm, I'm not sure that I would want to if it's that close because, you know, it would be better to blow up in the blast than it would be to get the, uh, the results of that radioactive exposure and go through that. That's pretty bad. So, but they are survivable. Prepare for them, similar to preparing for natural hazards. So you can kind of look at your guidelines from Unit 1. What, what would you do? Some of the things in that unit one are more relevant to Seaborne events than others are. So, uh, what can you do to prepare for a nuclear blast? Not really anything, right? You can do like in the 50s and build a fallout shelter under your house if you want to. 
that would be good for the tornadoes, which is a much more likely thing for you to be worried about. But your tornado shelter that would keep you safe from that 200 mile an hour two before is not going to protect you from nuclear fallout. Nope. Those little holes that they get in there with their name to let a little air in. Bad thing. So, um, so one thing you can do is shelter in place. We've talked about this, I believe, before. When you shelter in place, it's because the outside atmosphere and environment is unsafe for you to get from where you are to another place. So if it's unsafe to go anywhere else, you've got to stay where you are. So I've got to keep the outside environment from coming in where I am. So that means I shut off any air handling. If you have an air conditioner or a central air, you shut that off because that draws air from outside in, right? So if I've got chemical-laden air, biological hazard-laden air, and I'm sucking it through my system into my house, I may as well just walk outside, right? Uh, so shut it off. Uh, keep, of course, windows closed. Uh, a lot of times they'll tell us to take uh, plastic and tape over your windows, you know, uh, over the door. Once you get inside, you tape off your door because there's cracks under the door. Look through these doors. There's cracks all around. It's not airtight. So uh, for me to feel protected and to keep that what's outside out, I would need to seal that off, right? And you can use that with masking or duct tape and uh, plastic, right? Now, plastic sheeting to cover air openings, uh, vents, anything like that. I'm going to stay in an interior room, tape sheeting over the doors, windows, vents, duct tape, seal other areas. You need to have a battery powered radio uh, so you can hear about what's happened. If, if you're actually in that type of event, somebody will eventually be talking about it. So that's how you get information. An all hazard radio, you should, everybody should really have an all hazard radio uh, that'll listen to. You. you can send emergency messages over that radio. So, and then with uh, the Swift 911 app, I'll be sending stuff out on that. Swift, assuming I survive, I'll be sending out information on the Swift 911 app. Monitoring equipment, you really don't know whether it's okay or not okay. So, you depend on outside work. Think about if it's eight degrees outside and you shut off your heat, your central unit, right? It's no heat. That's an issue, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's winter time, you know, you're going to have to bring some warm clothes and a blanket and bundle up. Be prepared to be cold. It's going to be cold for a, a I don't know if you're going to be there for 20 minutes or three days. Don't know. This would be the same for a hazmat spill or a hazmat incident as well, right? So the dangers for people, even though you shelter in place and say, well, that's the safest thing for you to do, the dangers are extreme weather conditions. What if it's a day like today's going to be, where it's going to be super hot and grandma's there and your, and your six-week-old infant is there? The extreme age groups, the very young and the very elderly, are the most vulnerable in those types of events, right? Uh, the heat, we've already had heat-related deaths in Missouri this year. And usually those are people that don't have air conditioners and they're in usually high heat's the biggest problem. And it's elderly people normally, but it can be infants as well. Think about the kids that get left in the back of a car. How long does it take for one of them to get hurt or killed? Not very long. Minutes. Just minutes. So we're essentially doing the same thing to ourselves when we put ourselves in this room. So sheltering in place is not something for me as emergency manager, it's not something for me to take lightly. There are things that I should try to do before I make that step, 
if there's any way to do it because there are inherent risks at sheltering in place in really, really hot weather or in really, really cold weather. But there may be no other alternative, okay? And that may be the, just, I'm just filling in on things to be aware of, okay? When somebody tells you the contaminants are gone, you want to ventilate the room. From radioactive fallout, if for some reason that were a thing, you want to get inside a building. Distance and shielding are the answers. So, um, there's three different type, types of radi radiation. Alpha, beta, and gamma. Okay? Gamma is the incredible hope. Hope, <laughs> man! That's gamma. That's the, the bad one. Start with the little one, alpha. Alpha radiation. I can protect from alpha radiation by shielding. A piece of paper will stop alpha radiation. Okay? So all I need to be is, if this was a, an alpha source, I can be probably this far away, a foot away, and I'm okay. Now if I pick it up and I hold it, I'm looking at it like this, then that would be a problem for me. An alpha part can be particularly dangerous if you ingest it or breathe it in or get it inside your body. As long as it's outside your body, it's fairly safe. I mean, all you got to do is be a little wet. I won't say it's safe. Relatively easy to protect yourself with. Uh, time, distance, and shielding is the things we talk about with radiation. So. Limit the amount of time I'm close to it. Stay away and have some shielding. And it don't take much to shield from alpha. Beta particles, okay, I need to be a little farther away. I need a little thicker shielding. It can be shielded by a cardboard box or, you know, something like that. Beta is still fairly easy to protect from. Just stay away from it. Limit my exposure time to it. I can be close to alpha particles for a fairly long period of time without significant harm. Beta, I, it, I have a little less time to be close to. Then we get to gamma. Gamma particles are the bad mojos. Gamma is one that requires lead or thick concrete to shield yourself from a great distance. If they were gamma particles, I'd want to be... 100 feet away, 200 feet away, depending on just how strong it was, okay? Uh, I don't want, you know, any exposure that I had to have for whatever reason, I'd want it to be very, 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 very limited, very short, okay? So, uh, if that type of environment were to happen, I want to go deep inside a building. Remember that distance away from where the, the source is will protect me. Stay inside and then stay tuned to wherever you're getting your news for reports because they'll be reporting to the public when it's safe to come back out. That could be from a military transport convoy that comes through and that contains some kind of device that has a, a, an incident. Uh, we actually had one in southern Dallas County years ago. A military transport uh, crashed, and I thought it was—I thought it was uh, like little missiles. It looked like little missiles, but it wasn't. It was some other thing, and it wasn't it wasn't hazardous, but it sure looked like it. If the military has a crash, something like that happens, they won't let you get close enough to do anything. You—you you will not be up there investigating. You'll not be getting. Close. They won't let anybody. They won't let you get close. The military doesn't operate that way. You guys know that. This is our scene. You stay back. We'll handle it. So, well, they'll probably see just a perimeter is so. up. Exactly. Now, the, the you know, highway patrol or local law enforcement might be involved, but uh, they're not. The military will take care of it. Uh, decon procedures. If you, in your cert clothing, get into a contaminated area and you leave that contaminated area, what did you just do? You expanded the contaminated area. Yeah, now you're still contaminated, 
And every step you take, you make that contaminated area bigger, and you make our job more difficult to clean up after. Correct? So, how do we alleviate that? How do we fix that? Because, I mean, you can't stay in there forever. We can pitch a tent, but you're going to get tired of cooking over Sterno eventually and want to go home. So, well, we have to clean you up. You have to be deconned, decontaminated. And that has to happen in the area where the decontamination, where the, where the contamination area is, right? Because if I do it outside the contamination area, then I've just made the area bigger, correct? Mm -hmm. So generally, think of it this way. The area where something occurs, where contamination occurs, that's the hot zone, okay? The area where I want to be is, so here's the hot zone. Where do I want to be? I want to be way over there, right? That's the cold zone. Make sense? Where do I want the cold zone to be? Right beside the hot zone? No. If my evacuation distance for a particular product is 100 feet, I want where I am to be 300 feet, right? Not right 100 right. feet, one inch. I want to be away. And the distance between where I am, cold zone, and where the hot zone is, that's the warm zone. Or think of it as yellow, red, and green. Where I am is the green zone. Where the bad stuff is, is the red zone. And the in between is the yellow zone. Decontamination happens in the yellow zone. I can't do decontamination in the red zone, can I? Because then everybody that's doing the decon is now contaminated. And so we bring new people in to decontaminate them, and now they're contaminated. And I bring more people. It, it's a never-ending cycle. So I have to decontaminate in a corridor. So look at this tile floor. That's a corridor going from front to the back, right? So this, this is my hot zone. This is where the bad stuff is. I want to decon. I'm going to do it in this corridor. I'm not going to do it everywhere because what that does is where the decontamination takes place and the clothing you take off, the water you collect, the soap, all that stuff is also contaminated if it comes in contact with you, right? So I want all that stuff in a specific area so it can be cleaned up by whomever cleans up the area, the contaminated area eventually, special company, right? So I create a decontamination corridor, and when I leave the contaminated area, I go through that corridor and I get decontaminated. And once I'm decontaminated, then I'm free to leave the yellow zone and go into the green zone. Does that all make sense? So what can we do? Take decontamination action, remove everything. Now, this is once again one of those places, girls, boys, if you've been exposed to a chemical, you're going to get naked. Sorry. And that's what's going to happen. If it's a chemical that, again, if it's a chemical that we got to get this off of you right now or you're going to die. Okay, is your modesty going to be affected at that point? No. No. You can strip me off on the square in front of a thousand people if I'm going to die if you don't do it. Okay. So, it's not a sexual exhibitionism. It's not that kind of a thing. It's a thing where... You've got to protect your life, and this is what has to happen to do that. So, they're going to take everything off. You're going to wash your hands, flush your entire body, and blot dry. We don't rub. We blot. Okay? Uh, when you wash your hands, do it like a doctor does. All sections, all, you know, and you do it thoroughly. Don't just do this. Okay, I'm done. That's not good enough. That's not how we're supposed to be washing our hands before we eat, even, is it? A lot of people do that. Some people don't wash their hands. But you know, 
that door handle right there may have fecal coal form on it. The handle at the doctor's office probably does have fecal coliform and all other forms of bacteria on it. And you go to the, take your kid to the doctor. It's got nasty stuff on it. I promise you it does. It, uh, unless somebody just walked by with bleach and cleaned it off just before you walked in, it's dirty. The water fountain, the pen that the receptionist hands you to sign that form, you lay your hands on the counter to pay your doctor bill, all these surfaces that the public touches, they're contaminated. And that's everyday life. So think about an event like this. It magnifies that, right? So I'm just explaining to you these are the, the risks. Here's what you need to do. Think about food safety. If the contamination got on you and you've got apples out there laying on the counter, it's probably on that. So when you eat the apple, what'd you do? Absolutely. Yeah. If you go to a restaurant, you know, if you're in a restaurant, all that food that's out there in the food bar, it's got to be got rid of, right? Very fresh. Sorry. So if you're training, you're trying to treat other people. First thing for you, we've said this over and over, your personal safety. Self-protective measures only. What can we do to treat somebody that's been contaminated? Nothing. Nothing. Can we keep ourselves from being contaminated? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't attempt to treat survivors in a contaminated area. In a contaminated area. Tell survivors about decontamination procedures. If April is contaminated and she's hurt and you show up and she's walking toward you, April, stop. Stay there. Help is coming. Here's what we need to do. Now, is April going to be listening, maybe? She may be in shock. She's going to be upset. She will be upset. Maybe her family members are hurt. People are not in their right mind. They're not like we are right now, talking and listening. She may not listen. But as she comes to you, if she interacts with you, if she tries to get out of the hot zone, what can we do? Knock her down? Knock her out? Hey, lady! Yeah. No. She may knock you out. <laughs> can't, we can't really do that, can we? No. All we can do is try to get them to listen to us, right? Can we, can we stop somebody? Not really. But keep in mind, if you grab them, you're contaminated. Right? I'm going to try to talk to them. Okay? Self-protective measures over. We cannot treat the survivors in the contaminated area because if we go in the contaminated area, now we're contaminated, just like we talked. So now you're part of the problem. You made things worse. We're not supposed to make things worse when we get there. We're supposed to make things better. Right? If you're making it worse, you're not doing it right. So... We can talk to survivors. I'll give you a real quick, I try to keep these short and relevant. Um, how many here play, has ever played with mercury, liquid mercury? Nobody? Not very long. Well, I have when I was a kid. You know, I used to bust a thermometer. That was the coolest stuff ever. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, in the welding class, I had a thermometer where they, it, the bulb was exposed, but the thermometer is still worse than now. Yeah, well, <laughs> that, it, that was, it was still in the glass perfectly safe for you to play with. But mercury itself is a hazardous material. It causes all kinds of problems in the body, right? So they don't recommend that at all. And maybe that explains some of my issues. I don't know. But uh, there was a kid, two kids actually, uh, from a family that were playing in a shed out by Longley. And they found, uh, there used to be these vitamins called chocks, uh, Vitamins, they had this little, it's a glass bottle. It had a little a plastic stopper around the glass, and you just stuck it down in, and it, it sealed the bottle up. That's Chalk's one-a-day vitamins. Remember? Anybody remember? Well, this vial was about this tall, and it was three-fourths full of mercury. It was a pretty, I don't know where they got all that much mercury, 
But they were playing with it and doing this and doing that. Well, at some point, they dropped the bottle and it broke. And now the mercury spilled out in this shed. The kids walked through it, got it on their feet. Well, they went home. They walked around their house for a little while. Didn't say anything to mom and dad. They decided, hey, let's get supper. They got in their car, drove to Buffalo, and went through a drive-in, and then took it back home. And then they were going to uh, traffic. Uh, they were getting ready to take a shower. And I got on the radio and said, no, stop. Do not take a shower. If they had taken a shower, that house, their car, every interaction they had was all supposed to be decontaminated, right? Mercury. That means the ambulances are draped the shelves, they get decontaminated. Gross decon at the scene and then deconned again at the hospital and they'll get transported for at least to get looked at and maybe treatment. Uh, and if they had took showers then the fallen protocol, they would have to dig up their septic system clean all that. All the carpet's supposed to come out of the house. I mean, it's really a deal. So it's a cool day, and I respond out there. The deputy that had been in the house touching this and that, now he's got leather, his leather holster on and everything. Leather absorbs, right? So that leather is all toast. His holster, you know. He's walking around with his hand out like this, you know, for quite a while. And what does it say uh, back there? Remove everything. Well, this is a, a fairly young couple. Uh, the husband had really long hair and a ponytail. The wife was knockout gorgeous. Three kids. One's a baby. Holding it in her arms. And then two little ones. A cold day. And there's a bunch of old fat guys from the fire department. A lot of them, several of them had beards like you. And we're standing around here and the pre and I know they've got to be gross deconned before we put them in a whatever and put them in the ambulance to be transported to Lebanon. And I'm thinking, I know what's supposed to happen. It was tough. I don't want to get this hot wife naked in front of her kids, in front of a bunch of fat old men out there in the night, and it's cold, so, you know, I don't want that. So, how, what am I going to do? How am I going to do this? So we finally rigged up a line, there was a clothesline, we hung sheets, had, some, had them hang sheets over the clothesline, we arranged for warm soapy water and some washcloths from another place, set them out there, and they disrobed washed themselves, put on like a jumpsuit from the a deal and took a, a clean quarter out around the sheets and came to the ambulance that way. Was able to figure out how to get them cleaned up enough to get them in the ambulance where they went to the hospital and got declined. But that happened at long lane, uh, I don't know, 15, may, maybe around 2000 or shortly after, you know. So even though this says remove everything, depending on the circumstances, you know, you may or may not. Now, if that had been a chemical that would cause their heart failure or respiratory collapse or whatever, and it's going to say they're, they're going to die, guess what? Every one of them would have got naked right there, and we would have cleaned them up, and they would have, we didn't have time to mess around. The way it was, because it was mercury, I figured, okay, it's it'll be okay for a few minutes. They've already been walking around with it for a while, so we rigged up a way to do it. But it's happened here in Dallas County. That's, that's a true story, so think about that. Okay, what will you do? Follow your size up. We've talked about the size up, and you've got that chart in your book. Uh, suggest you make we'll make we'll make some cat pads that have got those available so when you get on scene you can go through the questions help you do the size up what is going on how bad is it can it get worse so how much worse can it get what can I do to take control of the safety 
answer if it's a, a radiological event. Is what can I do? Time, separation, and, and uh, distance and shielding, right? Shielding. So I don't have shielding materials, so what do I have? What's one thing I have? Distance. Separation, right, distance. What resources will be needed? Well, stuff that we don't have, right? Right? Mm -hmm. on, on any of these seaborne events, if it was a high yield explosive, could we come in after a high yield explosive and do some basic first aid and triage? Sure. What if there's a secondary device? You don't know. Are you trained to know that? They're getting out where the, the people, they know the responders are coming in, so what do they do? They do the initial device and they put a secondary device that can go off to take out the responders. Because again, they don't want you to come in and start helping people, they want them to die. Right? Right. They want them to hurt. So they put in a secondary device to do that. That happened in, uh, when uh, the Olympics were in the United States, there was a bombing. Remember there was a bombing and a dumpster? And then they had a secondary device that went off, timed to go off just a little bit later, so the responders could be there. That was Atlanta, I think it was in Atlanta, I believe. Uh, I believe you're correct. Very good. I couldn't answer that if you'd offered me a thousand dollars. Oh, good. So, the sum total of what we've learned here is A, it could happen here. There's a lot of different ways that a terrorist could promote their agenda. We learn how to maybe recognize the signs of them. If we do recognize signs, what are we supposed to do? The Notify the authorities. That's right. There's what can we do? Not much. Except try to tell them to stay. Keep yeah. ourselves safe, right? Yep. Can we treat the victims? No. It depends on the type of attack it is. If it's an explosive, maybe we can, but we think about our first, our own safety first, right? Maybe it's a high yield explosive like the Edward R. Murrow building. Uh, okay, so collapse is an issue there, was an issue there, right? Uh, World Trade Center, collapse was an issue there. So even though it was an explosive type device, you still may not be able to do something because it may not be safe for you to be in that location. Correct? So, if it's not safe, what do you do? Stay out. Sorry to tell you that. This is not a one-way mission. You're supposed to go home at the end of the day, right? Right. So, a terrorist attack to intimidate the government or the civilian population to further their objectives. They want to create mass casualties. Disrupt resources, vital services of the economy, and cause fear. That's a real big one there. So, what are some weapons? Chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, high yield explosives, seaborne. You guys will see that over and over. Okay, the protocol, for instance, terrorist incidents are a stop sign. Sorry. Don't proceed if you suspect it's terrorist activity. Don't touch, move away from the object or area, and report it to the authorities immediately. Simple enough, right? Not very, not very satisfying, I'll admit. But, okay, here's the deal, guys. I'm, I'm trained to the hazmat tech level. So if I had the equipment, I could put the suit on, and I wasn't 65 anymore. I could put the suit on, I've put the suit on and go into the area and put the chemical in an overpacked drum and seal it up or stop the leak. I've, I've done all that. But I don't have a team. I don't have the chemical equipment. And I'm 65 years old. It gets really hot in them suits, especially a day like today. You better be in shape. Right? Because you're huffing and puffing. Because you're sealed in. So, what does that mean for me? It means I've got enough training to recognize things. And I can't do anything about it any more than you can. So, if it's 
one of these terrorist events. Sorry, that's beyond our level of training. So, we're not doing it. Okay? Any questions? Alright. So, I believe we're at the point of doing our summary. Anybody need to go up and go to the bathroom and stretch your legs? I'm going to set this section up. We're going to race through here and get done. Yeah, pretty good time. This is going to be the final. I'll tell you what I might do. If we get done early enough, we might go ahead and take, and I want to tell you this. There's a, a multiple choice final test. That you don't need to freak out. If you take it and you don't pass, you take it again. You'll take it till you pass it. Okay. Like the uh, online. Yeah, yeah. You don't need to say, "Oh my, it's a test." Most people get test test anxiety. Okay. Don't have any test anxiety. If you need to take it four times to pass it, that's okay. The only thing I get anxiety if you ask me to write an essay in there. I'm like, I'm horrible with the structure. No, I have copies. I have plenty of copies of the test. I don't know if you have any printed off with you, but I've I've got several. <laughs> Do you have some? Yeah. Okay. Well, if you have some, that'd be great. Yeah. Uh, we, we, I think we're going to be done in enough time that maybe you can do that uh, beforehand. And then here's going to be the process. Uh, once you get your test complete, once you get your NIMS done, I'm going to run the background checks on you guys to make sure you're not terrorists or, you know, if you're convicted uh, mass murderers, well, guess what? You won't be on the team. Just, I hate to break the bubble. <laughs> But uh, uh, we do we do run the background check, but you can understand the reasoning for that. Other than that, no big deal. Uh, once that's all done, and I get your your NIMS stuff in my hand, I'll give you your completion certificate. I hold the certificate until I get the NIMS stuff because I got to have a lever, otherwise people just keep putting me off and never get it done. So. When you get the NIM stuff, you get your nice printed certificate. Uh, a few of the t people from the team, uh, seems like everybody's busy, so I don't know how many's going to show up. April won't be around this afternoon because it's her son's birthday today, so she's got stuff this afternoon, and that's understandable. Uh, the other team captain uh, is sick, got uh, hurt her neck, got bit by something, didn't she? And she's been having lots of issues. Um, she's gone to the doctor several times, and they can't figure out what's going on with her. Let yeah, so she's attention. not going to be around. So I know at least two or three of the team are going to be there, so I'll introduce you there. Uh, I'll pass your CERT t-shirt out once you guys complete your the background check and all that stuff. We've got t-shirts for everybody. Uh, the other team people that are, are going to show up, if they show up, uh, I don't know, if do you have the listing of what sizes? For the others, I do. Um, on the sign-in sheet that you guys did today, do you mind just putting what size shirts you wear so I can have record of it? Yeah, I have that over here. Okay. We'll, we'll get that back to you. Uh, so anyway, that's kind of how the process will work. And then uh, down the road, uh, we need to make sure that we have a good way. You know, the best way is for if you're online is check our Dallas. We have a Dallas County CERT public page. We've also got a private page. Once you're a member of the group, then she sends out messages that way. Unfortunately, we've got a few people that don't do Facebook, like Doug. I'm sure he didn't see your deal. So no, unless you emailed him, I didn't. he didn't know anything about right. it. Right. So uh, that's why we need a good email. We need a, a cell phone or a, so we can text you. Just a way to get in touch. If, if you do Facebook, that's how most of the, they communicate most things is by putting it on the group search page. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, you got your notifications on, it'll pop up saying, hey, here's what's going on. Uh, but if you don't ever do Facebook, if you don't have an account, and you're not going to, please notate that so we'll know that we have to contact you a different way. All right? That makes sense? I actually got my phone reactivated, and uh, since I got my NIMS done, uh, you want me to email those to you, print them off, and hand them to you, or what? Yeah, what I'd prefer is that you go ahead and just print, print the certificate, print one for me, and uh, we'll keep a copy of one here just as in a folder, 
everybody gets a folder and I'll have a copy of your stuff and then you keep one for yourself. So print two. Okay. I got a printer at home. I don't know if you want me to email it or... It's whatever. I mean, you can even hit reply on that email that I sent and send it to me that way. Okay, that's what I was thinking about doing, but I wanted that's to ask fine. first. That way we got, like, two different copies. I got a copy of digital, you'll have a copy of digital, yeah. I'll have a physical copy, you'll I'm have a I'm fine with that. I, it, not a problem. That way we can be covered on all bases. Yeah, people, occasionally people lose things, so... Uh, it's good to have the backup. For all my training that I've got through my career, I've got paper copy of everything. <laughs> everything. Because I should have got a bill of ladings and such that I had from when I drove over the road. Yeah. Well, I yeah. I know that we've gone over all this stuff individually, so we'll just talk about the main basic broad things. Okay, we talked about making a home disaster preparedness kit, okay? We talked about both the home and workplace preparedness. We talked about a disaster supply kit to contain the things that would help you. Remember, CERT is, first off, knowing how to make yourself better prepared to survive a disaster and then being able to help other people after the disaster is over. But you have to survive yourself first. So we talked about assembling a disaster supply kit. We talked about developing a disaster plan. What are we going to do? Remember we talked about meeting places. We talked about where in the house, all that stuff. We talked about a safe room. <coughs> we talked about evacuation versus shelter in place a couple different times during the course. Uh, the best place to be when something bad's going to happen is some other place, if possible. But if that's not possible, then we need to know how to keep ourselves safe within our safe area until it's safe to leave. Uh, specific things we talked about. <coughs> we talked about a variety of different things that might affect us from natural hazards, storms. We talked about terrorism today. Okay, uh, in fires, fire safety and utility control unit. We talked about hazardous materials. We talked about UN placards, which are on the side of trailers. We talked about fixed facility markings, which are the NFPA 704 placards. Uh, we talked so identifying the material that's involved, if possible, from a safe distance gives us an idea about the hazards that may be involved. For instance, if there's a poison involved, I've got to worry about getting it on me or in me, right? If it's an explosive, I've got to worry about it blowing up and taking me out, right? So different concerns for those hazard classes. Uh, I talked about defensive strategies with hazardous materials. What's our defensive strategy? Stay away. There you go. Stay far enough away you can cover the, the incident with your thumb. Be about right. Oh, like Remember, fallout boy. Uphill, huh? Like fallout boy. Uphill, upwind, upstream. Right? Uphill, upwind, upstream. That's where I want to be. Okay, because the vapor cloud's not going to go against the wind. It's not going to flow up the hill. Right? So if I'm uphill, upwind, upstream of a chemical, I'm probably safe. And if it's explosive, I need to be far enough away to, to reach the evacuation distances. Um, and we've got the emergency response guidebook. Are you guys familiar with that at all? I am. You are? I'll, I'll get a, I'll get one out here in a moment, and I'll show you. Uh, let you Blue at least. Book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're great. Okay, utility controls. We talked about mm -hmm. gas. We talked about how the shutoff valve on gas. If it's aligned with the pipe, it's on. If it's perpendicular to the pipe, it's off. Uh, that's for natural gas pipeline, propane. 
it's the tank, we shut the valve off, you know, if we can, if we can get in the area. But again, what do we do as CERT members in a hazmat scene? Don't touch it. We stay away, right? So you got to remember, I'm wearing my CERT hat, not my fire department hat. Okay. I'm going to be right back. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so we talked about gas, we talked about electric, we talked about a lot of places now have got the outside shut off. You know, the older houses, uh, they have a main breaker in their utility box if they got a breaker box. We've got houses in Dallas County that's got multiple breakers, got the little arm on the outside with the screw-in fuses. There's still houses like that around, you know. And there might you might shut one off and find out there's two more in the house where they've added on over the years. So just because you shut one off doesn't mean you got all the power shut off in the house. Uh, water, we talked about that. Uh, size up. We talked about the CERT size up process, and you've got uh, in your book, you've got uh, a, a sheet that kind of helps you go through that. What questions do I ask? If you answer those questions that are in that size up process, it helps you determine what action to take, whether I should take anything or not, right? When it talked about firefighting, we talked about the resources we have available. Now, you guys all know that if you burn the bacon in the skillet, if you put the lid on the skillet, you know the fire goes out, right? Because we smothered. That's removing the oxygen is what that is, right? No. Take away the oxygen, the fire doesn't burn. The same theory applies if somebody's on fire and we roll them on the ground. Right? Basically, you're smothering the fire between their body and the ground, so the oxygen goes out. We throw a blanket over them, same principle. We're smothering the fire, okay? Uh, and that's the principle you, we use when we use a fire extinguisher. The, the carbon, or not the carbon, the powder fire extinguisher, which we use it today. The powder extinguishes the fire because it smothers it, right? That's why you, when you do the sleeping from side to side, you just kind of imagine rolling a blanket over it. You don't start on top of it immediately. You just start no. back a little bit and slowly roll it over. Right, and, and we're not talking 15 seconds to do it. We're, I mean, it's pretty quick, you know. But, yeah, I just you roll it over top of it, okay? Um, we talked about interior wet standpipes of course this is just knowledge we we won't be doing that but we know what they are talked about the oper operations and limitations of those the fire department doesn't want us there fighting fire with the hose and that's not a certain team thing so we're not going to be doing that but you know what they are so if you're asked to help for some reason or show them where a standpipe was at least you can say oh I know what that is there's one right over there. Uh, portable fire extinguishers, we talked about how to identify what they are. We talked about the classes of extinguishers, they're the classes of fire, right? Uh, so <clears throat> we talked about looking at the label on the extinguisher to identify what that extinguisher is good for. And we also talked about the little listing on there that tells us what the rating on it is to know how much fire it can actually put out. That's important to know before you just grab an extinguisher and go in, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Part of the assessment process. If I've got a 1A 10BC, Juanita, what does a 1A stand for? Every unit of A is equal to one gallon of water. So 1A, it's a gallon of water. Uh, it's equivalent to a gallon of water. So that powder is going to put out as much for an untrained person as a gallon of water would. How much fire am I going to put out for a little gallon of water? Trash can? Maybe. Yeah, if it's not a big trash can. Oh, yeah, right there. Yeah. Uh, 10B is what? Uh, 
two times, let's say like a 20 for, no. 10B stands, the, the 10 is square feet. Square feet, yeah. 10, 10 square feet. feet. Yeah, that's what I was saying. So it's a pub, three by three. Uh, you know, it's not a very big pub of flammable liquid. Class B is flammable liquid. So, and class C is energized electrical equipment. There's no size rating on that. Right. Okay. So, it's energized until you remove the energy from it, then it becomes a class A, right? You may or may not remove the energy from it. An ABC extinguisher is perfectly fine to use on an energized piece of equipment. It's not liquid, so the, the shock is not going to come back to get you. I wouldn't want to spread garden hose on an energized electric equipment. Or the uh, silver uh, extinguishers they have that do have liquid agent in them. Well, but we didn't suggest you use those on class no. C. Yeah. <laughs> they They're not listed for class C. Yeah. They're only listed for, that's why you look at what the extinguisher is rated for and match that to the type of fire you have. Yeah, but if you see someone running towards an electrical fire with one of those silver Ooh, fire extinguishers, <laughs> well, you just stop and you go, well, that's the one that's the yeah. different gene pool. Well, that's, <laughs> that's, that's not the right time. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, we talked about their, uh, their capabilities, and we talked about their limitations. By knowing the rating, if I've got a 1A10BC and I've got that wall's on fire, what's the limitation? I can't put that out with that. So don't put yourself in that position. Why go in there and spray one extinguisher knowing it's not going to work? Unless there's somebody that in there that is trapped and you need to try to get them out and you feel like you can get them out and yourself out with that extinguisher. Okay? Remember, it's not a kamikaze mission. You're not here to sacrifice yourself to save somebody else. Because if you do that, then you're not around next week to save somebody else. And yeah, that one gallon might be able to clear a path. Well, that would be the assessment process. If fire, let me, if you're clearing a path because fire's on either side and over your head, you got no business being there. You're yeah. in over your head. <laughs> you, you got no business being there. Yeah. That's that's a fire department thing. That's not a cert team thing. Yeah. So that's where we let the fire department take the hero role. We stay smart. Okay. On these blood, sorry. Safety equipment or safety uh, considerations. Must use our safety equipment at all times. Uh, gloves. How many times have you had that little voice that said, you know, I really shouldn't be doing this, or I really should have a pair of gloves on, and you said, that would be all right. And then within seconds, you've hit your finger, you've got a splinter, you cut your finger, or whatever. How many times has that happened to you? It's happened to me a lot. That little voice tries to take care of me, and I ignore him, and then I pay the price. Well, anytime I do any kind of lifting or work with anything sharp, I always put gloves on. Well, if you always do, that's great. Some of us know better and don't do it anyway. So, um, wear your safety equipment. That includes your goggles. One of the easiest routes of things to get in your body is through your eyes, because they're mostly water. So it's an easy place to absorb things into your body. Chemicals, uh, so you want to have splash protection. If you're working with patients, you want to have your goggles on because people spit, blood spurts, sorry. It's wet and warm and it ain't yours. You don't want it on you. So protect yourself, okay? CERT members must always use the buddy system. Talked about that. Nothing solo. Fire suppression group leaders should always have a backup team available in case the initial team gets in trouble. They can, somebody can come in, and the fire department uses this principle. It's uh, uh, rapid intervention team. You've got your initial team. You've got a backup team. Just the way it is. Okay. Disaster medical operation. Three killers are what? Breathing, bleeding, and shock. Airway, yeah, which airway. is breathing. Yeah, airway, bleeding, shock. shock, yeah. 
Absolutely. You're right. ABS. Just the wrong word. ABS. Yeah. Okay. We talked about, so the first thing we treat is airway, right? We talked about the head tilt chin lift method to open. We talked about if they've got facial injuries, then you can put your head on the forehead, and tip them back, and move it back to a neutral position to try to maintain the airway. Bleeding. We talked about direct, direct pressure. Something addressing on the wound. We talked about elevated. And we talked about using the pressure points. You've got femoral down here in your groin. You've got your brachial. Okay. You cannot use the carotid. Do not apply direct pressure to the carotid here. You just kill somebody. Okay. Can't, can't use that one. You can put, you can apply direct pressure. But we can't use the pressure point to try to stop it. Okay. Not yeah. Basically. Training for shock. We talked about put the patient's position positioning. Uh, maintain their body temperature. So you can always put a blanket over them. Uh, don't give them food or drink. Okay. Uh, triage. We talked about doing triage. How to do that? Remember, uh, everybody that can hear my voice, walk this way. That takes care of your walking wounded, right? Those people are not immediate treatment. They're delayed. Okay? Some of them may not be injured at all. If they're not injured at all, they get no treatment. So, you guys move on down the road. And then, we go to the people that can't come to me, and we assess them based on our tags. You know, either they get immediate treatment, or they're, they get the black card. Or they get delayed. The delayed people that can move are already over there. We may have some people that's delayed treatment, but somebody's got a leg injury and can't walk. That don't mean they get immediate treatment. Depends on if they're bleeding or going into shock or not. The three killers are immediate treatment. We treat that right now or they will die. Okay? But if somebody's got a leg injury, but their, their vitals are good, they're not bleeding, uh, they can be delayed, then we can give them a D. They get treated a little bit down the road, and we're going to treat those ones that if they don't get treatment right away, they're not going to make it. And there's some people that are injured badly enough, either A, they're already dead, or B, they're, we can't do anything for them. We don't waste time treating them. That's the triage, okay? Uh, we talked about head-to-toe assessments and uh, the, the acronym DCAP, BTLS. D C A P B T L S. Okay. Remember that? In your book, that's a real good an acronym for you to remember what you're looking for as you're doing your head to toe assessment. Looking at your gloves periodically to make sure that uh, you don't see blood. Because if I'm rubbing and I find blood but I didn't feel anything, I mean there's a cut. Okay, so I need to look and see a puncture or something. Find out what it is. Uh, let me see. Wound care. We've talked about what to do with wounds. Okay. The special consideration when there's head, neck, or spinal injuries are suspected. What do we do? Maintain C-spine. Try to maintain C-spine. We don't let the head flop around when they roll them up. For me, the entire leg, right? It's what I would splint. Mm -hmm. It's my elbow. I'm going to splint from the wrist to the other. If it's my wrist, I'm going to splint my fingers up to my elbow, right? Do you try to go a joint above and a joint below, or from above to the below? Uh, basic treatment for various injuries. We went over the basic things, including uh, bee sting. What do we use? Like a credit card or a plastic card to remove the stinger, right? Mm -hmm. If it's a poison, what do we do? We scrape it away from the body, not to brush it away from the body, not up the body. We don't want to brush it up to other areas on the victim or on ourselves and get exposed. Remember that? Uh, we talked about search and rescue. Remember, it's light search and rescue. We're not going to lift an airplane off of somebody. Uh, but there's really two things involved. We always say search and rescue because if we find somebody, we're searching for them, we find them, 
Then we got to rescue them. So it's really two things, right? Searching is one thing. Mm -hmm. We may search and find nobody. And if we find nobody, then well, there's no rescue to do, is there? Correct. So search and rescue is two functions. Okay, remember we're going to rescue the greatest number of people in the shortest amount of time. So if I've got several people missing and I find a group here and another guy that's hanging off the side of a bluff, what do I go? I, do I start my high angle rescue rope team to get this person that's hanging off the side of a bluff? Or do I get the greatest number first? I'd move the group first. Yeah, probably what I'll do if I've got a whole team there, I'll put somebody starting on getting the people together to help this person, but the rest of the bunch is going to go get that group and get that out. Do them both. Greatest number. Rescuing the lightly trapped survivors first. The most heavily trapped one is the one that's going to have to wait. Uh, size up. Again, we go through that process. What are the construction types that makes a difference on the hazard that the team will face? Right? Mm -hmm. uh, in Joplin, that big box store that people took shelter in that had the big high block wall that was 40 courses high and there against the back wall and the back, that wall fell in on top of it. That's a lot more of a hazard than maybe a steel frame building where the steel is all bolted together and it makes a strong frame. It might rip the skin off, but the frame probably not going to fall on me, is it? Mm -hmm. So the construction type is important for you. Uh, we talked about uh, the... Related hazards that go along with uh, with uh, size up on uh, building collapses and stuff. Talking about structural damage, light damage. You've got cosmetic damage, but the building is still on the frame, on the foundation, right? So light damage. We're going to go in and do our search. We talked about moderate damage, where again the structure shows more damage, and I can't remember the criteria, but uh, it's still on its foundation. Then we could still possibly go in and do assessment or a search, right? If we think there's victims. What do we do if there's heavy damage, the building is off its foundation? So we don't touch it. We don't go in. We make a note of it and... Yeah, we, we no, don't go in. Another fight of right frequent but Light damage, we're absolutely going in. Moderate damage, we probably will go in if we have reason to believe there's should be somebody, there. could be somebody or in there. Be Heavy damage, we're not going in. Nope. Uh, search techniques, oh, on the, on the damage, we also talked about the types of uh, collapses we have. We talked about the V type where the center falls and there's stuff on either side. The we talked about the pancake curve. where they kind of fall on top of each other. And they made it look nice and neat where one each one was cut up on the side. But there may be four that just fall right flat. And, and then at the bottom there's a thing, you know, there's all different kinds of... That still be considered a pancake collapse because one falls on top of the next. And then we talked about the lean-to where one side's up, the other side's down. So there's three types. Uh, search techniques. Remember we talked about whether it doesn't really matter, it's individual choice whether you want to start on the bottom floor on a multi-floor building, start on the bottom floor and work your way to the top or go to the top and work your way down. Doesn't matter. Uh, I myself prefer starting at the bottom because I don't want to leave somebody behind walking by and not find them you know, make my way up. But uh, we either want to do a left-hand search or a right-hand search, make your way through. We talked about marking, not just marking on the outside door. Remember, we make one line, we put the name of the cert unit that we are on the left, put the date and the time when we went in at the top, right? Date and time's up here. Certain unit is over here. And the line, kind of diagonal line goes through. When we come back out, 
you make the other part of the mark when you've completed the search on the right over here you put down uh, no up here at the top you put down when you completed the search and on the right over here you put um, let me see what was it oh uh, having a brain fart guys what are you looking at it no uh, I know down at the very bottom is where you put down the number of victims you found. Remember we put L, 2L, 1D. Yeah, and top, put time we, in, time out. That's the top. Bottom, On the L, right side we put down where where they were transported. Yeah. yeah. That's where it was. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I had to think that. I too. thought the right side you put down where you searched in the building. Yeah, right side is where you searched in the building. The very bottom is where you Oh, the bottom is where we put down where they, that number How and many? yeah. Thank you for correcting me. This is you recording this. Maybe. Ed, edit this. Okay, <laughs> it never happened. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that is correct. That's correct. And that's what I asked. About. What we searched, where we searched, and so as I'm going through, if I start at the bottom floor, and I work my way up, and I get to an area, maybe, maybe. Uh, there's a whole wing here, one wing of a hospital. I might want to make a mark at the beginning of that hallway to indicate I've searched this whole area. Or maybe there's a wing that I didn't go down for whatever reason. It's too hazardous. I felt like structurally it was not safe. Uh, the fire was too big. We, didn't, we couldn't go down. Then I would make a mark and indicate not searched. I would still put the date. Top, I still put the search team number, but on the right, then we would indicate that we didn't search that area, okay, and the reason for it. Units, you know, you know search, corridor damage, you know, whatever that corridor or central hallway or whatever, not searched due to fire, okay. Just so, so anybody that comes back in, they know this area didn't get searched, or maybe it's the pediatric ward, or maybe it's the Alzheimer's unit didn't get searched. Well, whatever, whatever it may be. Uh, but that's a universal way to mark. So any other cert team from another state that comes in would be able to see what you did and understand what was done and what wasn't done. Uh, document your search results. We talked about it in that video. Uh, once you've searched, that you document. I want to maintain that it's probably a good idea for somebody, if you have enough people, to somebody to uh, document as you go. Because you won't remember, if there's four or five people, you won't remember everybody and what you did. You just can't. For the same reason as we maintain our span of control three to seven, you just can't maintain that much information without blending it together and, and polluting it. So. Uh, Try to have somebody document as you go. Rescue techniques, we talked about survivor carries. Uh, if you remember the different carries, we talked about the one where you somebody gets behind the survivor under their arms, the other person gets their hand beneath their knees, they're each facing each other. It's a pretty good way to move a victim, but it's hard to walk. Somebody has to walk backwards. And it's much harder, unless you're a freak of nature, to have both people, both rescuers look in the same way. Somebody's got to pick them up back this, and it's, unless you've got gorilla arms, you know, or some crazy anatomical feature, it's hard to do that for a seven foot tall person. Right. It's, it's just, it's hard, it's, it's you're, you've got your butt right in their face, and it's just hard to pick them up. It's, I've done it, I've tried it. Um, we talked about uh, the blanket carry. And as you see our supplies, we've actually got a, a special blanket that's made to, to, you can roll the victim up on that blanket and it's got carrying handles and stuff and keep them out. We've got a, a triage tarp that spreads out, which gives you areas where you put stuff. Now, you may not want you, where do we want our morgue if we have deceased people? Oh, uh, separate away and, and hopefully kind of, Separated, screened off, 
if we can manage that, that'd be great, you know, just for the psychology of the, the survivors. Um, we talked about using the chair, you know, works pretty good. But again, think about, think about all the, all this is dependent. If I've got a 450 pound guy that never met a Twinkie he didn't like, then a chair may not be very good because a if it's a wooden chair, are the joints going to hold? Well, no. I mean, you know, I mean, no, I'm not being facetious. It's just those chairs aren't designed. I, I happened to watch a lady that probably weighed that much at Maple Street last night sitting in there wooden chairs. I've seen one of the wooden chairs collapse before. They're just glued together. They can't take anything you give them. So they, if we tried to get a wooden chair, we're going downstairs with a wooden chair, bouncing, stepping, and doing this, and those front legs come apart, we can drop the victim and do a lot more harm, right? So think about what you're using. They didn't have a spinal injury before, they probably did now. Yeah, I mean, we don't want to make things worse. <clears throat> so yeah, there I don't think I would carry my father in a chair. We talked about putting them, firemen's carry it, Grab them over your shoulder and bend them slightly forward. That would work for somebody your size, maybe even your size. For me, because I'm tall, uh, Juanita could never carry me. She'd bend her over and be looking at the ground, and my feet would still be dragging. And I'm too heavy, right? I mean, so common sense tells you, even though that's available to me, that's not going to be the kind. Now, you might be able to just put your your hand around my neck and under my leg and just pick me up and carry me. But I don't think yeah. so. So you gotta match the type of carry to the vic to the victim, their their physical stature, to the type of injury they have, and to your own physical stature as well. Right? That's why we got multiples. Uh, we talked about leverage and cribbing. Uh, we're gonna practice that today. I will tell you that when you're moving objects, I don't care if it's a sidewalk segment or a beam or whatever, anything that you're lifting, you do not put any part of your body under that. Okay? If you want to keep it, you don't get it under there. Not once. There's ways to put your cribbing in place without doing that. And we will practice all that today. Okay? The idea is when we lift a heavy object, now if I've got a, a, a beam that's attached up there and it's down here, it's fell on somebody and I'm trying to lift it enough, first off, I need to assess if I lift this end, will that end stay put where it is? If I lift on this end, will that end come down? That's a pretty important decision for me to make, right? Mm hmm. If I think that'll stay and I lift this end, then I don't. I only have one end to lift, right? If I think that one's going to fall, then and it's 16 feet in the air. How in the world am I going to crib up 16 feet to keep that from dropping when I lift on the other end? The yeah. answer is I'm not. So that's out for me. I can't do that, right? Right. That don't makes, make sense. That takes some specialized lift gear, or Maybe the idea is, can I remove anything beneath the victim? As long as I don't make the pile drop. There's, there's things to consider. Things that you lift come up levelly. I don't lift a heavy object like this, because that can cause it to slide. And that's very, very dangerous to the victim and the rescuers. So, when we lift that up, it's going to come up straight. We talked about the lifts and drags. We talked about putting them on a sheet. You grab hold of the sheet like this on either side of their neck, raise your shoulders slightly up, and drag them across the floor. Great way to move. Be working on some of that stuff. <coughs> we talked about the organizational structure for CERT. In our structure, we've got what? There's me. And there's team captains, right? Right now, that's our structure. Mm -hmm. And then everybody else is on the same level. We may add to that as we get bigger and as people are qualified to do it. So, but right now, that's our structure. So, 
April, Jennifer are going to be your team captains. They're the ones that are hopefully will be available if we deploy the team. If not, then it'll be what it'll be, you know. Uh, we need effective communications among you. I think I found those, we'll, we'll talk about that, but those Balfung radios, there's 20 of them for 100. I forget what it was, 100 and some dollars. That's probably the best way for us to go. So, uh, so everybody will be issued a, a radio eventually when we get the money to do that. And then, uh, it'll be your, of course, they won't belong to you, but it'll be your responsibility to take care of it. And then we can communicate each other with each other that way. Keep them the rest of your starting year. Accountability. Uh, we talked about, remember, we talked about Hispanic control, right? We talked about knowing where everybody is at all time, Count, counting for everybody, make sure everybody comes home. Uh, we talked about the objectives of command. I'm going to figure out what the scope of the incident, and we do that by doing a damage assessment. How big is this? How bad is this? Who's hurt? Who's not? How many structures are involved? Uh, then we're going to figure out what an overall strategy is, what type of logistical requirements. I need more manpower. I need certain pieces of special equipment. I need just a whole bunch of, I need a bunch of cases and bottled water. Just safety, safely. Uh, if I need six people to do assessment or to respond, there's no point in me having 40 people there, is there? That's okay to have extras because if you get tired, you should be able to come out and rest and another group come in and take your place. So I'm not saying if you need six people that you should only send six. But I am saying it doesn't make much sense if you need six people to have 40 people out there sitting in the sun getting hot, drinking water, disrupting their day, and having nothing to do. Because I'm going to tell you, it's a long day when you're sitting in a staging area waiting to be deployed, and you don't get deployed, and then they send you home. Now, that could happen. <coughs> That's part of the game. But if I use my resources wisely, hopefully everybody that responds will get to do something so they feel justified in responding, okay? Uh, we talked about disaster psychology. After something has happened, both the survivors and the workers can experience psychological and physiological symptoms of stress. There is a lot of stress. You're going to experience stress. How you cope with it depends upon a lot of different factors. <coughs> How physically fit are you? How much sleep did you get? Do you have other health issues going on that affects you? Uh, what's your family life at home? Are you under a lot of stress from work? Or you'll under a lot of stress from your significant other if you have one. Or is your your best dog really sick and you're stressed out about that? That's not a joke or a, or a pun. Uh, we love our pets just like we love people. Well, sometimes better, you know. And uh, so if you've got a, a loved one, whether it be a fur baby or uh, your cat or... Hopefully it's not a snake. I can't stand snakes, but <laughs> whatever. Uh, I would never snake at the house anyway. My dad doesn't like snakes either. <clears throat> anyway, you know, those relationships we have with those loved ones around us can affect our stress levels. Excuse me while I get my voice back. <clears throat> okay. The steps that CERT leaders should, we talked about the steps CERT leaders should take to reduce the stress on team members. What are those steps? <coughs> Before we get, to a, get into a, a incident site, should brief the, the, team, the team members. As to what to expect. What to expect. That a tornado go through 
a daycare center. There was 47 young children there, and we we expect there will be some you know, fatalities. You know, we know there's injuries. You know that ahead of time. It's going to help, other than you're just expecting nothing, and all of a sudden, boom, there they are, right? So briefing you ahead of time about what to expect helps you prepare yourself emotionally and mentally for what you're going to find. The steps certain members can do to reduce their own stress levels. And we talked about all those things, you know, that you can do. Exercise, eat a healthy diet, all those things I don't do. Eat a healthy diet, get enough sleep, all those things, right? Remember those? Strategies for helping survivors work through their trauma. What were those? Be an empathic listener. Mm. Right? Don't say I understand. Yeah, that's a tough more one. likely you don't. That's a tough one for me because I, 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 I've done this enough. I, I think I understand, but honestly, I'm not being a survivor of a tornado. I've not been a survivor of a disaster, even though I've worked quite a few. Uh, do I really understand? No, I don't. I can't put myself in their shoes. So, um, all that list that we talked about. Now, we, today we talked about terrorism. We talked about seaborne indicators, chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, high-yield high explosives. We talked about our CERT protocols for terrorist incidents. And what are CERT protocols? Stop the hill. Yeah. If, it's, if we have, we talked about all those indicators, and if there's an indicator, even a few of the indicators, this may be a terrorist event, we don't respond, right? We stop. Mm -hmm. Okay. We talked about protective actions following a terrorist incident that may be sheltering in place, right? That kind of walks us generally through. Is there any big things that we didn't talk about? Any questions you have? You've read the book. There's more detailed information in your book, right? So my, my intent is not to cover every word that's in your book, but to cover all the topics. So hopefully you've read that and it added in, fleshed a little bit more about what we talked about. Do you guys feel comfortable with the course and what we've talked about so far? Mm -hmm. Okay, so did you get those those final tests? We'll just do these. Yeah. And I'm not going to say these are open, but they're not. So, but you, you can leave your book there. Just close it.